Hello friends, welcome back to my channel. My name is Aviel, Israel's super guide from the land of the Messiah. Friends, if this is your very first time discovering my channel, I would like to warmly invite you to subscribe. I also want to remind you that every single week, I upload new and engaging videos focused on this fascinating land, as well as the Bible and a wide array of topics related to Israel and its surrounding regions. Join me on this journey to explore and learn more about these incredible subjects. On this beautiful morning, we enjoy a sunrise together. Behind me rise the majestic mountains of Moab. Do you remember Ruth? That is the very place where she originally came from. Well, today we will be discussing, and this informative short video is all about Sukkot, which is known as the Feast of Tabernacles. But where exactly do we find details about this feast mentioned in the scriptures? To achieve that, we will utilize the scriptures, and as you read through them, you will have the opportunity to observe from the sky a truly fascinating and breathtaking view of the magnificent Judean desert landscape unfolding before you. So, where do we first learn about this exciting feast happening in these coming days in Israel? In the book of Leviticus, specifically in verses 39 to 44, important laws and guidelines are outlined. On the 15th day of the seventh month, after you have gathered and harvested the produce of the land, you shall joyfully celebrate the feast in honor of the Lord your God, giving thanks for his blessings. For a full week, the first day will be designated as a complete rest day, and similarly, the eighth day will also be a rest day. On the very first day of the festival, you shall gather the finest fruits from the best trees, along with branches of palm trees, branches of lush, leafy trees, and willows found along the riverbanks. You are to celebrate and rejoice joyfully before the Lord your God for a period of seven whole days. You shall joyfully celebrate special feasts in honor of the Lord for seven days each year, as a lasting decree for all your generations to follow. In the seventh month of the year, you shall joyfully celebrate it for a total of seven days, living temporarily in booths. All the native people of Israel shall dwell in temporary booths, so that your descendants may come to understand that I made the Israelites live in these booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God, who delivered you from bondage. Thus, Moses declared the solemnities and important rituals of the Lord to the Israelites, ensuring they remember these significant events in their history and maintain their faith in God's guidance and protection. This is the powerful and true word of the Lord. Well, as I was saying, we are here in this beautiful desert. You can now also see on the interactive map exactly where I am currently located in relation to the historic city of Jerusalem, providing a clear visual context. Well, dear friends who are currently watching us, we can clearly observe several important points of this meaningful solemn celebration. First and foremost, we dedicate and offer the Lord our time and devotion for all seven days of the week. In these seven days, well, Actually, they are eight days. On both the first day and the eighth day, there is a special holy convocation. We should refrain from working as we do on the Sabbath, which is meant to be a day of rest and reflection. And for a full seven days, it is during this time that we first read where the Lord specifically commands us to rejoice. It is intended for the natural Israelite, and we must therefore live in temporary huts, shelters, or tabernacles. In Hebrew tradition, the term refers to a zukkah, which is the reason this joyful festival is aptly named the Festival of Sukkot. During the significant historical period of the First and Second Temples, notably the Grand Temple built by Solomon and the subsequent temple that underwent various renovations over time, the devoted farmer would bring the very best of his harvest to the temple. This offering, which might include a portion of his crops, served as a heartfelt act of thanksgiving and gratitude to the Lord. It symbolized not only his appreciation for the bountiful blessings he received, but also his commitment to honoring his faith and the divine. Such acts underscored the profound relationship between the people and their devotion to God during these pivotal moments in their history. Now, with the complete destruction of the sacred temple in the year 70 AD by the invading Romans, significant changes are upon us. We can no longer offer the traditional sacrifices that were once central to our religious practices. However, we read that it is considered a solemn and perpetual feast celebrated annually. That's precisely why, even to this very day, we joyfully continue to celebrate this cherished festival. Now, 
Why does the Lord command us to live for nearly an entire week in these temporary tabernacles, specifically in these huts or zukas that symbolize our journey and reliance on Him? Well, there are several profound meanings to that statement, which is precisely why I find myself here in this vast desert. For forty long years, we endured life in the desert, and throughout those years, the Lord faithfully sustained us, providing for our needs and guiding us through the challenges we faced along the way. Furthermore, it also serves as a reminder that our clothing and sandals remained in great condition and did not show any signs of wear. Do you happen to have a beautiful dress or a stylish pair of shoes that has wonderfully lasted you for 40 years? Behold the remarkable provision of the Lord, even in a place as arid, dry, and sweltering as the harsh desert landscape. Now, this vibrant celebration also encompasses various other reasons and holds a multitude of meanings. There are, in fact, numerous valuable lessons and insights that we can glean from this festival. However, I aim to keep these informative videos succinct so that we can enjoy a brief glimpse into what this fascinating celebration is truly about without going on for too long or overwhelming anyone with excessive information. This way, we can appreciate its essence in a more engaging and digestible format. That's precisely what the comments section is intended for, to thoughtfully address your concerns and questions, or you can also enrich the discussion by sharing your knowledge and insights about this particular celebration and its significance. As I mentioned earlier, there are a total of four unique and distinct species of plants that we are utilizing for our festive celebration this week. There is a free market called Mahani Yehuda, where we buy these species. What species are these? We will now see it on screen. The Lulav, which in English translates to the palm tree, the Etrog, which is a fragrant citron, the Hadas, which refers to the aromatic myrtle, and the Arava, which is the slender willow branch. During these weeks, we were blessed to take four unique species, and as part of our tradition, we recite special prayers with heartfelt devotion while raising our voices to the heavens. We also gesture toward the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west, symbolizing our connection to our surroundings. This sacred rite is meaningful, and participating in it is not only acceptable, but is also a ritual instituted by the Lord for us to honor and observe. He is the one who officially instituted the sacred liturgy even within the temple. We do this every year. But do you know what the key difference is with the various rites involved? If there is no genuine intention of the heart, and if there is no true faith present, then the experience becomes monotonous and repetitive, much like what we often encounter when we go to a church service, right? We continue to create the same songs and the same choruses, repeating those familiar hymns every single week. We can sing those songs for many years and years, but if there's no genuine intention coming from the heart, then what's the point, right? Faith in what we do or say gradually becomes predictable and monotonous. Now, why focus on these four important points then? Due to this significant event, we are proudly declaring that God has bestowed a precious gift upon the entire world, and we sincerely hope and fervently pray for a peaceful and prosperous winter ahead. And friends, do you truly know what a good winter season really means in this particular part of the world? If we experience rain, and if it indeed rains, then it will surely be productive, won't it? For the farmers. Today, this nation continues to depend on the land, right? We will be very advanced in both technology and pharmaceuticals, yet we still persist. We have truly managed to make the once barren desert bloom beautifully and thrive with life. Now, it is quite interesting that these four distinct species, the rabbis, discovered something deeply spiritual within it. For example, the etrog, right? The one that closely resembles a lemon is a unique fruit that possesses both a distinctive flavor and a fragrant scent, and the wise rabbis have compared it to four diverse types of people in the world. One, the etrog, for instance, is the knowledgeable individual who deeply understands the scriptures, is well-versed in the Torah, and consistently performs good deeds. Then we have the palm tree. The palm tree produces a very sweet, delicious fruit, yet it lacks any noticeable scent. Thus, the rabbis commented that this reflects a person who knows the scriptures but lacks good deeds. Then comes the hadas, which is this small yet significant leaves. As we observed on the screen, it does not bear any fruit, yet it possesses a delightful aroma. This represents a person who may not be well-versed in the scriptures, 
but still demonstrates commendable good deeds through their actions. And finally, we have the willow. The willow tree possesses neither a pleasant scent nor edible fruit, much like a person who is unaware of the scriptures and lacks any good deeds. Rabbis provided a spiritual interpretation of the text. So, let us strive to embody the qualities of the etrog and the cider, meaning, let us cultivate and bear good fruits, and importantly, let us deeply understand, or rather, fully grasp the word of God. As James wisely stated, faith without corresponding works is ultimately just dead. Now, how do we specifically see this significant feast in the New Testament? In the time of Jesus, certainly. Here's the expanded version of the original text. Well, doesn't John tell us in chapter 1, verse 14 of his book, that the word, which is divine, dwelt among us, just as the Lord God was with his people in the desert for 40 years? Just as he graciously dwelt among us, the word became flesh and truly lived among us, sharing in our human experience. It's quite fascinating that during the era of Jesus, there existed a significant water feature known as the Pool of Siloam. The photograph you are currently viewing illustrates its appearance from the past, capturing its historical essence, while the subsequent image showcases its current state as it looks today, revealing the changes that have occurred over the centuries. A dedicated priest would carefully draw fresh water from that sacred well and then ascend to the temple, singing joyfully the ancient songs of ascents, which encompass Psalms 113 to 118. Upon reaching the altar, he would pour the blessed water as a significant part of the ritual, symbolizing gratitude and spiritual elevation. Everything is symbolic and ritualistic, but why? A symbol of a prosperous winter season, which traditionally signifies that a bountiful harvest is sure to follow. It is quite fascinating to note that during this significant period, particularly leading up to the birth of Jesus, there was a profound and widespread expectation among the people. They believed that God would soon pour out his Holy Spirit abundantly upon them. This anticipation included the hope that he would dwell among humanity in a unique way and guide his followers through the leadership of his promised Messiah, who would fulfill ancient prophecies and bring about a transformative era of divine presence and guidance. Can you imagine? Expectation during Jesus' time was that way. Therefore, we are going to read together now in the Gospel of John, specifically in chapter 7, verses 37 through 39 for a deeper understanding of its message. Knowing this important information now, we can better understand what John wrote to us. The final day of the feast celebration. Which feast? At that lively feast, the most solemn figure, Jesus, stood up and shouted loudly. He didn't just speak, he shouted. Let anyone who is spiritually thirsty come to me and drink deeply. Whoever truly believes in me, as the scriptures have beautifully stated, Rivers of living water will flow abundantly from within them, bringing life and refreshment. He said this, referring specifically to the Holy Spirit that was to be generously given to those who truly believed in him, for the Spirit had not yet been made available, because Jesus had not yet been glorified through his resurrection and ascension into heaven. This is the Gospel of the Lord, and here is the essential cultural background of that significant time period. What is Jesus saying? Want the Holy Spirit? I can provide what you need. That's why many people were saying. And if you continue reading the next two verses, they were questioning among themselves, well, is this truly the Messiah we have been waiting for? And they said, how can this be? He was identified as a Galilean by his accent. How can it be? Does the Messiah have to come from the tribe of Judah? Some believed in him and others did not. Here's the expanded version of your text. And what I particularly appreciate, if we take a brief moment to examine it before concluding our discussion, is found in Isaiah chapter 12, verse 13. I will read it quickly for clarity. Isaiah 12, verse 13. This verse beautifully connects with your understanding, as it states that you will joyfully draw water from the springs of salvation, symbolizing the abundant blessings and hope that come with faith. Friend, I kindly ask you to consider removing that specific word, salvation, since when we hear it in Spanish, English, or any other language, it often loses its true meaning. The word is Yeshua, which is the name of Jesus. The prophet had foretold him. What is he saying to you? I am the one who provides the refreshing living water. Come to me for nourishment and fulfillment. And now we can better understand, then, the significant religious and cultural background that informs the context of this particular passage. Tabernacles maintains a significant and meaningful connection to its rich past. Why? 
because it brings back memories of our unforgettable time spent in the desert. That's why we are here this morning in the desert of Benjamin. That is why God commands us to dwell in booths for seven days. Why? Because although today we live comfortably in sturdy houses constructed of cement, brick, or wood, which are securely built to withstand the elements, in the desert, we once lived in a simple hut made of natural materials. For these seven days, in addition to celebrating, this experience serves as a powerful reminder of our time in the desert and that God provided for our needs, generously giving us the nourishing manna from heaven each day to sustain us. And let's always remember that we are completely dependent on Him and on all the blessings and provisions He generously gives us, right? Our daily sustenance. Life is fragile, my friend. The fact that you are watching this video is already a blessing in itself. Do you know why? Because you are alive and experiencing existence, you should cherish life itself as a beautiful gift. It truly is a precious present. But this situation is also closely connected to what lies ahead in the future. The prophet Zechariah, specifically in chapter 14, verses 16 to 17, delivers a profound message that we will read together shortly. We are almost finished with our discussion. Zechariah's insights are significant, and I believe I have included the relevant text right here for our reference. The survivors from all the various nations that once attacked Jerusalem will annually ascend to the holy city year after year to bow down in reverence before the King, who is the Lord of hosts, and to joyfully celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Furthermore, if any family among the nations chooses not to go up to Jerusalem to humbly bow down before the King, the Lord of hosts, they will not receive the life-giving rain in their lands, which is essential for their crops and sustenance. This is truly the sacred word of the Lord. Therefore, we can clearly see the strong connection we have with both our past and the potential future. All right, friends, now we're going to wrap things up with that. I'll be showing you a brief video clip. Now, what specific actions can the Gentile church, which is the Christian community that is not of Jewish heritage, take action with? What can you learn? What valuable lessons can you learn from attending this feast? Certainly, here's an expanded version of the original text. Firstly, it is essential to acknowledge that He is the ultimate provider of all our needs, that He continuously dwells among us, and that He has graciously given us the Holy Spirit as a gift through our faith in the Messiah Jesus. Moreover, it is important to remember that our time here on earth is temporary and fleeting. Friends, I sincerely hope that this brief lesson truly proves to be a genuine blessing and valuable source of insight for each and every one of you. If you have any questions or concerns, feel free to ask. We are always here to serve you. I want to remind you that every single week we are consistently uploading informative and engaging videos about Israel, as well as exploring various scriptures, not just through this channel, but also across my other social media platforms for your convenience. Let us know where you are watching us from. And I would like to gently remind you once again that my name is Aviel, known as Israel Superguide, proudly representing this remarkable and historically rich place, the land of the Messiah. I sincerely wish you a joyful and delightful celebration during this special season of Tabernacles. Looking forward to seeing you, my friend, next week with more about this fascinating land. Shalom.